2023, I looked back on the past few years and asked myself, why don't I put a premium on fun this time? I stand by each and every list maker from the past year and every GOTY or AOTY or COTY uh, of the past few calendars, but you ain't exactly gonna toss on Hostile Architecture by Ash Inspire when you're having a good day, are you? The scaffolding holding the bread from the mouth! The pure, unmitigated joy that Tiny Rooks brought me in 2022 ought to have made it a shoe in for any such ranking, and yet I've brushed it aside with the self-justification that it had notched a list spot in the year of its full release, all the while snubbing the full release of Prodeus because I had already squeed over its early access form. This contradiction is not lost upon me now. But as I began manicuring this year's list, I swiftly found myself running up against a problem. I had already had nine surefire slots filled out of my ten by August. Every early access game I adore that was inbound for later this year loomed over me. How is old Melody gonna get out of this one? I mean, I hope you didn't pay attention to the title or the thumbnail of this video, but this preface is going to feel, if we're generous, belabored. I play too many superb games in a given year for a mere top 10 to feel appropriate. And now that I began preparing for this video in August, in fact this part of the script was written in mid-August, as opposed to late December as I had last year, I could now have my cake and eat it too. I could have my odes to carnal pleasures and not feel the crushing realization that I'd relegated one of my beloved, profound, ambitious, and meaningful TM faves to the horrors of <gasps> being little more than honorable mentions. So, honorable mentions? Honorable mentions. Blasphemous is one of the few souls likes I've ever gotten into, so it's no surprise that Blasphemous 2 would end up landing on this here list. It's blasphemous, but better still just as wonderfully morbid and morbidly wonderful as ever. Another softball down the center of the plate would be the remake of Strike Force Heroes. Yes, the AI is borked and the jokes are unfunny, but I wouldn't have it any other way. It's a pure rush of nostalgia that I can't get enough of. But I also couldn't get Plantera 2 Golden Acorn out of my mind either. Building upon its delightful predecessor, Plantera 2 is one of the finest idle clicker games out there. Immaculate vibes, lovely music, and a truly ludicrous endgame. Now, if you want a roguelite that'll serve up some utterly ludicrous runs, then you oughtn't look further than Paper Planet. The mayhem you can unleash in it is something to behold. And mayhem is also what you'll find bountiful in Forest Fire. It activates all of my rampage slash destroy all humans related pleasure centers in my brain when it comes to playing the part of the baddie. And then fire physics are something of a spectacular sight. Much like the sight of a crab annihilating waves of foes, both crustacean and crustacean in Crab Champions, this year was awash with banger action roguelites, with co-op modes and crap champions is no less worth the plunge than one of those you'll find on the list proper. Elsewhere on the actual top 25 you'll find no shortage of RPGs, so I'll take this moment to give grace to those I ended up having to leave out. First, we have In Stars and Time, which totally rules, though you can absolutely feel the fatigue setting in in longer gameplay sessions so it's one worth breaking up rather than blasting through in two or three sittings. To be honest, I played Start Again a prologue, its predecessor, and it certainly would have listed if it had released this year. It's shorter and thereby lacks any such fatigue. Small Saga is also a short RPG by all accounts, and it's wonderful too, uh, but I didn't play it enough, alas. Uh, that being said, it has some of the coolest battle animations and music of the year, and is a must for other RPG-loving fiends. 
Then we have Final Profit, which doesn't play like a traditional RPG throwback, but it sure as hell feels like one. And yes, a lot of that comes from it having been crafted in RPG Maker, but it still has that elation from leveling up as you attempt to fight a fire with fire against its corporate goons. You've also got to love its script. There are some really hilarious jokes and characters in this thing. As for the last of this batch of RPGs, we have the Bookwalker. Now, the Bookwalker sets out to merge role-playing combat with point-and-click adventuring, and it's a killer success. Wickedly funny and totally gorgeous, but don't be surprised if you find your feeble mind meat being stumped by its wackier puzzles as mine was. Rather than stumping my dumb head, boss game The Final Boss Is My Heart ended up being one of the greatest personal tragedies of stumping my dumb fingers. Boss game is so wonderfully queer, hilarious, and heartfelt, but I simply get filtered by its rhythmic boss rush gameplay. But not every game that I've sucked at despite loving this year was insurmountable, for years truly, as Cardboard Town showed. It's a deck-building city builder, all about proper placement of tiles, one that's seen some rebalancing to make it easier to grasp, just as its difficulties began clicking for me. But I ain't about to complain about the game being made easier since now I can eke out much lengthier runs too. On the inverse, we have Bone Razor Minions, which I once had mastered more or less, only to return after its 1.0 update and get wasted lol. Uh, but I don't hold that against the game. It still owns Bones, and it'd be on the top 25, in fact, if it weren't for another game in its genre that I handily prefer. A similar case would be Bolt Gun. Bolt Gun is a rad as hell boomer shooter with outstanding combat and fantastic animations in a year where it just so happens that there's a boomer shooter by Doug Moore. Yet there's no such game out there quite like Dredge. It's a fantastic horror fishing game. Unfortunately, I'm what's known as a scared little bitch, so I did not log enough time into it to list it. And yes, I know that there's a scaredy cat game mode now, but I have yet to revisit the game for it. Slay the Princess is another remarkable horror title that will not be making the final 25, through no fault of its own. However, as a visual novel, this is much more my speed, so I'm fairly sure I'll end up regretting kinda snubbing it like this. It's wonderfully written, illustrated, and fully voice acted, so it's a shame that I've not spent enough time with it to not get into the main rankings yet. Cobalt Core is a game that I'll probably be kicking myself for HMing too, as it's a game that is well within my wheelhouse and I foresee myself logging many hours into. It's just that it's a newer release and I've been scrambling lately, so I haven't spent enough time for it to grow into a lister either. Elsewhere in the world of roguelite deck builders lies Wild Frost, a game that I have spent enough time with in wood considered to be a worthy of such an honor, but it just landed shy of the list. Still, it is one of the most gorgeous games of the year, and one of the most unique games in its genre yet. And finally, we have The Pale Beyond, another chilly game with marvelous hand-drawn art, but it is by no means as adorable as Wild Frost. This is a survival moral management title and sells its frigid atmosphere brilliantly. It was an early contender for listing, honestly, but I have sadly not returned to it enough to see how it stacks up to the games which have remained lodged in my brain this past year. So, without further ado, let's get started on those games, in no particular order, except for like the final four-ish. And what better way to kick the door in than with one of the games that I've spent the most time with this year, Heretic's Fork. Another game I absolutely stink at, but it is such an infectious time. Killer gameplay, loads of tat to unlock, and a neat layer of meta-horror narrative to spice things up. This game came out of nowhere for me and swept me off my feet after Raven Age, the publisher sent us early review code for it. 
For my second choice comes a game that I've known for a long time with something special, and that is Long Gone Days. One of the games that has stuck with me the most since my days plunking through demos on Itch.io. It is an outstanding indie RPG with a unique hook of being centered on translation. It looks beautiful, it's beautifully written, and its gameplay is smooth as butter. Hell yeah. And can we give a hell yeah to Samurai Punk for the final project under their banner? Killbug? It has to be one of the sickest FPS titles of 2023, and is the true heir to the Devil Dagger's Crown. We don't talk about Hyperdemon. Between the impeccable visuals and electrifying combat against waves of creepy crawlies, lovers of that 2016 classic will find themselves mightily at home with Killbug. Yet Killbug sets itself apart from Devil Daggers and its Boomerang X-esque approach to verticality. And when it comes to extreme verticality and movement, you can't go wrong with Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. It's the Jet Set Radio game Sega didn't want to make until Bomb Rush Cyberfunk had already swept in to satisfy the world's need for propulsive rail grinding, gloriously cell shaded visuals, phenomenally funky tunes, and beating the fuck out of some of the boys in blue. And while we're on the topic of kick-ass games with radical politics, I can't ignore Luck Be a Landlord, one of the best anti-capitalist satires in the medium yet, with an infectious core gameplay loop and terrific music to offset the occasionally questionable pixel art. Fortunately, pixel art fanatics watching will find much to love in Sea of Stars. SOS has long been one of my most anticipated games since its announcement, and you know what? doesn't quite measure up to those expectations, as it suffers from some pretty bad writing when the past couple of years we've been swimming in a sea of indie RPGs that blow it out of the water in terms of characters, dialogue, and narrative. However, 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 the breathtaking pixel art, music, exploration, and battle system are more than enough to notch it a place in my top 25. Speaking of games which have had my eyes glued onto them for several years, we have Cosplay Club. The follow-up to Chroma Squad, which was one of the first games I've ever purchased on Steam, no less. Cosplay Club is the game that soaked up my attention most in December. Now this game has a lot of rough edges to it in need of polishing, but the core of dressing up my magical girl in wondrous costumes about as addictive as the distinct charm that ebbs through both it and Chroma Squad. And Charm is in abundance and on guard, though technically a Souls-like in its methodical melee combat. What on guard most reminds Mrs. Melody here of is one of those gonzo mid-budget games from the PlayStation 2 era that just went in on some weird and cool-as-hell concept, tossed in some delightful jokes and vibrant environments, and just swung for the fences with what they had. And the core conceit with on guard is a doozy, you're a bisexual lesbian Zoro strategically swashbuckling through rooms of dastardly villains. What the Rifleman lacks in a bold hook, it makes up for in being a free-to-play title with responsible monetization, in a lobby-based FPS with some of the tightest gunplay for a game that you can spend $5 USD at most on. It runs smooth as hell, and laser beaming through an entire enemy team with your bolt-action rifle never gets old. Meanwhile, Venba is a gorgeous game where getting older is an inescapable part of the story. It's a brief and lovingly crafted narrative puzzler about raising your family as Indian diaspora in Canada. Uncompromising and heartwarming, it is well worth your time and money for how effective it is. Switching gears into something that is more goofy, we have Dungeons 4. It's the Dungeon Keeper X Warcraft hybrid that EA and Blizzard could never outdo. Devilishly funny and eminently playable thanks to its riveting blend of those aforementioned classics. Plus, the voice acting is astounding. Turns out 2023 was a great year for great games with great voice acting, as Goodbye Volcano High is further evidence of. Not only that, but it has some incredible queer representation, music, and writing that hits like a 10-ton truck, echoing the fears both of being a gender non-conforming person around family members who aren't exactly the most supportive, 
and the universal terror we've all been enduring over the past few years. It is simultaneously one of the best queer games out there, and one of the first great stories about the pandemic. Furries were eating good this year in general, though, as the chaotic Friends vs. Friends shows. There's a reason why this has been one of my favorite games to play with Dan, and not just because I've been beating his ass like a drum throughout our sessions of it, or because it looks amazing, though both of those are true. No, it's a creative PvP FPS that leads to those wild moments between pals that you'll be bragging or playfully bitter over for years to come. Now, I fail to see how anyone can be playfully bitter with Darkest Dungeon 2. It's one of those games that I love to hate as it grinds my bones to dust, and sticks my nose in the mud for thinking I could ever salvage this run gone wrong. Yet, I can't deny that it is still one of my favorite games of this past year. It's brutal, but also oddly hopeful. Not to mention, it's gotta be one of the prettiest games from 2023. Another game that had me swooning from just seeing it in motion was Cocoon, an undeniable triumph from one of Playdead's former leads. Cocoon offers up an awe-inspiring puzzler that'll tease your brain while its delightful soundtrack lulls you under its spell. Less subtle in its appeals, shall we say? Arcade Again is the first of the two action roguelites that I alluded to while gushing over Crab Champions. This game just has such excellent combat and a breakneck pace to it that volleys it onto my roguelite regimen with sheer ease. Ignore the doomsayers, Arcade Again's a surefire banger. Is Dave the Diver an indie game? Definitionally, no. But my list, my rules, and this was one of the games I loved the most from 2023 by far. It reminds me of the heyday of oddball DS games no one ever talks about, and that feel like fever dreams. And yet, I can't think of a fever dream that is as tightly designed as Dave is. The deep sea diving and restaurant touring halves flow into each other so naturally that it's easy to find yourself positively hooked. If you love Pokemon as much as I do, then you'll almost certainly be readily hooked by the awesome cassette beasts. I mean, you're probably already well aware of it if you're a fan of the premier monster-catching RPG monolith who's watching this channel, but if you aren't, the monster designs rule, the music is killer, and it pulls a Hades by sneaking a dating sim into a game that's for hardcore gamers. Folks, you can fusion dance with your girlfriend as anime battle music plays, and then murder angels together. It's great. I shall present this clip from my banger alert on Vampire Slayer the Resurrection without comment, as it speaks for itself. Oh, fuck's sake! <laughs> Get the fuck out of the way! <laughs> <laughs> it's no secret that boomer shooters have been on vogue over the past few years, but one of the best ones, from my money, has been tragically flying under the radar this year, and that's Herald of Havoc. What makes HOH such a great time is simple. The controls are tight, the guns are fun to use with delightful alt fire modes, the exploration is edifying, and it's constantly introducing new wrinkles, new epic set pieces. Sure, it's meat and potatoes, but these are some of the best meat and potatoes you can scarf down. Trading first person shooting for first person b balling. First Person Hooper reminds me of just how fun sports games can be. It's chill, relaxing, and a blast to score attack in. Do me a favor and dunk on any of your friends who are outright ignoring this total banger. 
Another banger serving up crowd-pleasing, score-attacking thrills is Gunsuit Guardians, as a die-hard evangelist for its developer Matt Glanville ever since singled out, it should come as no surprise when I say that Gunsuit Guardians is the best game in this genre yet. Easily. It eats Vampire Survivor's Lunch and dethroned Bone Razor minions for me. Everything just comes together with GSG. The music and sound effects slap. The pixel art is just as fantastic as always with an entry into Matt's formidable ludography. Every run is fun and engaging. The levels have a lot more dynamism to them than those of lesser alternatives, and it is so much better designed. Just the fact that you can take direct control in a way that is intuitive, meaning that you can swap between making gun suit guardians into what is effectively a twin stick, and it being a garlic-like at the simple press of a button, absolutely revolutionizes how games like this ought to play. Need to aim at the boss, but the auto-aim is focusing on the pesky twerps around them instead? Just aim your mouse or joystick at the bastard until they get erased. And talk of erasing doofuses never ceases to make me want to boot up RoboQuest. RoboQuest is the perfect picture of an indie studio punching above their weight. I have had my eyes on this game since Rise Up were posting proof of concept screenshots of its UI onto the r slash indie game subreddit, and it has been magnificent watching it unravel into the towering beacon of a roguelite FPS it has become, now backed by Starbreeze as its publisher, believe it or not. Not only is it host to one of the finest combat systems of any FPS period, nor do my praises end at its self-evidently marvelous aesthetic. It is exhilaratingly paced, has felt fully fledged and polished to its gills for at least the past year of early access, and few of its ilk could rightly claim to be as fun as it is as co-op experiences. I have been wavering on whether or not to name the Cosmic Wheel Sisterhood my game of the year over the past few months. I'll explain why I've decided against doing so when I get to my gaudy pick, but know that it is through no fault of the Cosmic Wheel Sisterhood's own. It is everything that I've ever wanted from its devs to construct team. It's weird, hysterically funny, queer, beautiful, heartwarming, and heartwarming with all of the rough design elements of their previous outings shorn away. The music makes me feel like I'm levitating. The pixel art makes my heart melt. I keep saying heart, and that's ultimately because the game itself feels as though it has come from the heart. It's so warm and devastating. And then it slyly pulls another trick out of its head. What can I say? Over five years ago, Malin Radian published one of the best games ever, and five years later, with its sequel, they did it again. Honestly, my game of the year was largely a toss-up between the Cosmic Wheel Sisterhood and Fallen Hero Retribution, but we both know Fallen Hero will end up snubbed in every single other year in list beyond those in the know. Most won't have heard of it, or its predecessor, and for those who have, well, a text RPG doesn't make for great sizzle reel fodder, does it? And yet, if there was a sizzle reel of my moments of 2023, Retribution is dominant in it. My jubilee happening upon it on Steam, and then continually having my jaw dropped as hard as Fallen Hero 1 did? Peak. The writing is so captivating. The role-playing opportunities are as sprawling as ever, and it'll gut you at least a dozen times over if you let it warm itself into your brain. This is a game that deserves to be someone's gaudy, and I will gladly be the girl handing it that honor here. Of course, there are many other games which could very well be someone's game of the year for 2023. I haven't played a lot of them like Baldur's Gate 3. 
These are simply my choices, and I'd love to hear some of the games you feel that I've missed in the comments down there. Thanks for watching, and cheers.